Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you again. Um, really enjoyed being with you in January, for those of you who were there. Um, when we were invited last year to invite others to be our speakers, um, I immediately thought of Penny. Um, Penny and I, Penny Gladwell and I, um, were neighbors for a long time in the last community I lived in. Now we are frequently a Facebook friend. <laughs> and um, Penny will unroll her, um, her biography as needed, but Penny is a retired, press, uh, excuse me, Methodist minister. And um, when I met her in my last community, I learned that she was um, leading and guiding women's Bible studies uh, at a little uh, non-denominational chapel, Hedges Chapel, right next to where I lived. And I, um, I started attending those. And um, Penny has really become one of my favorite people. And I like to say I'm introducing her to other favorite people that I have. Um, so I would say Penny is a facilitated, uh, a gifted facilitator, teacher, and um, and leader. And she brings a lot of skill to the study of um, whether it's scripture or spiritual meditation, poetry. Um, she's got a real gift to guide the discussion. Uh, during COVID, oh, I guess what we did, Penny, mostly was we looked at women in the Bible. That was the focus greatly of our, our women's Bible study. And um, it was a lot of fun and a lot of, led to a lot of discussion um, where we could really reflect on our individual lives as women as well as our collective lives. Um, during COVID times, Penny also uh, facilitated, and I guess it was her idea, and brought it to life on Facebook Live. We had... Um, a series of meditations, both through Advent and through Lent, that people could join in. And she did a lot of work to make sure that we had materials to read and reflect on before and after uh, those sessions. Uh, Penny is also an author, and we'll, I think Carrie's going to, they can talk about that in a little while, but she's written three books uh, focused on women and I would say each of them is an exploration. It's the woman exploring her life in a very um, relatable way. So um, I'm happy to just hop off here, but say Penny is someone I find of has deep spiritual faith, a spiritual core that uh, shines in her life. She has a lot of humor and insight and the best cat memes ever on Facebook. So. <laughs> So with that, uh, I'll step down. Well, good hey, morning, and thanks for having me here. Is it hey, okay for me to Before we get started, um, I'm, I'm so glad you're here, and I'm going to ask Winona to open us up with um, prayer, yeah. and then you can begin. Okay. Winona, you're muted. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Dear God, hear my prayer for unity, that we may all love each other as you first loved us. May we act with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience toward one another, living in unity with you. May we lay down our swords, set aside our grievances, and forgive each other as you forgave us. Lord, lead us to take what you've given us, love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, and spread those in this world, lavishing them upon others in our lives. May your love bind us together in perfect unity. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. Um, Penny, please begin. Okay, well, I want to begin with a quotation that I found last year, and it was like, oh, I've known this. Um, maybe you've seen it. It's called Life is Amazing. Life is amazing. And then it's awful. And then it's amazing again. And in between the amazing and the awful, it's ordinary and mundane and routine. Breathe in the amazing. 
hold on through the awful, and relax and exhale during the ordinary. That's just living, heartbreaking, soul healing, amazing, awful, ordinary life. And it's breathtakingly beautiful. Do you like that? Yes. It speaks a lot to me because my life has been amazing and awful in almost rapid order. We've had uh, 17 different houses since I've been married. Um, we've moved every two and a half years for a while. And every one of those experiences was amazing and awful. If you've moved, you know that. Um, so I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about how I got to where I am and what I what I have reflected on about how my faith grew in those circumstances. Um, I grew up in a small town in South Jersey and my mom and dad had lived in the, that town all their lives. And so I figured I would grow up and I would marry somebody from the neighborhood and live in that town forever. Um, isn't it interesting how as children, we have such limited views of what life could be like. I was very involved in the Baptist congregation. My family was, dad was a deacon, mom fixed the communion. She taught Sunday school and we all went to vacation Bible school and sang in the appropriate age choir. Um, and one of the voices that I heard as a child was that of Peter Marshall. You remember stories, any of you remember Peter Marshall? He was the chaplain to the Senate, I believe. Um, and his wife was Catherine and she, um, was to me the paradigm of minister's wife. She was there for him. She was a support for him. And I thought, yeah, I could do that. I could be a minister's wife. So that was part of my thinking in terms of where I was going. Um, I could be a minister's wife and I could stay right there in town. Or all of mom and dad's friends were teachers. So I thought, mm, yeah, I could be a teacher and I could teach in one of the schools where I went to school. Again, a very limited but clear vision of where I was going. So then it became time to go to college. And I went to my minister of the Baptist church and I said, I think I'll go to that small religious school over in Philadelphia. And wisely, he said to me, I think you should look for a more rigorous study in the liberal arts. He knew that going to that school was where women found minister husbands. And he said he did not, I think he did not want me to limit myself to that possibility. I don't know what his thoughts were, but anyway, he convinced me to go to a liberal arts school and I was admitted to Chatham. It's now Chatham University in Pittsburgh. At the time it was Chatham College. So off I went to the big city and I earned a BA degree in history with a minor in education so that I could teach um, once I graduated. And so I began looking for jobs in the Pittsburgh area. I had interviews set up for schools in the city and in the suburbs. But I had met this man while I was in school named Dave and fallen madly in love. And he worked in the city, so it made sense for me to look for a job in that area. And we were going to be in Pittsburgh forever. Never say that without holding your breath. Because um, although that was so amazing to have a man and a place to live and a place to work, um, in spring of my senior year, 1967, you can do the math, um, he announced to me that he was uh, leaving his position at Dun & Bradstreet in Pittsburgh and entering a brand new career field called computer science. Does that date everybody, right? Um, Ashland Oil hired him and was going to set up this computer program for uh, HR and company benefits and that kind of thing. And he was going to be trained and then run it. Well, that was wonderful. I was so happy for him, but we had to move to Ashland, Kentucky. Now, I didn't know where Ashland, Kentucky was, he was from West Virginia, so he had a better idea. I had no idea what that was like. But 
being the loyal and faithful person that I was, even though I'd never heard of it, I said, we can make this work. So I took a deep breath and off we moved to Kentucky. Then I applied for teaching jobs down there. And the only thing I had available was um, first and second grade combined in a four classroom schoolhouse that had six grades. So one and two were together and then five and six were together and three was separate and four was separate. So I had kids coming into me fresh from their mother's lap because they had never had a, they, Kentucky didn't have preschool. Um, and it was awful. I was terrified. I couldn't understand what the kids were saying. They'd say things like, we're going to bring you flares, Mrs. Gladwell. Well, I didn't need any road flares, you know, like to put behind the car when the tire goes flat. They were talking about flowers. They were going to bring me flowers. And then they talked about Mimo and Papa, and I had no idea what that was. So it was a whole new language. It was a whole new culture. And I felt totally lost, and it was awful. And I insisted, I said, Dave, please don't make me go back to that school. But I did. And it worked out well, as it always, as it always had. Um, then Jennifer came along. That's our daughter. She was born in uh, 1971. And um, I fell back on my assumption that life would roll out the way my parents had. We built a house. We lived in Ashland. We were involved in church and choir and all these kinds of things. Um, I actually got a position playing viola in the Huntington Chamber Orchestra uh, at Marshall University. Um, by chance, I happened to be a viola player, and everybody always needs viola players. So that was a good inroad. Um, and I had a good life going. In fact, I decided since there wasn't any preschool, um, pre-kindergarten, um, I could start my own preschool. So I applied to Marshall in the program of a Master's of Art in Early Childhood Education and was zooming along, doing that, taking care of my daughter, um, being being very happy. And Dave was also going to Marshall. He was getting an MBA uh, in transportation because Ashland Oil was paying for that for him. So when he graduated, he said to Ashland Oil, okay, now I'm ready to move into the transportation division. And they said, we're sorry, we don't have a position for you there. That was awful. So he began looking for other jobs. And of course, one day he came home and he said, I have found a new place to work, a new company. And he named the company and I said, that's wonderful, dear. And he said, headquarters in Pittsburgh. So suddenly I was no longer going to be playing viola in an orchestra and I was no longer going to be working on a master's degree. And my whole life felt like, have you ever taken a sapling that's just beginning to grow in the woods or in your garden and ripped it up by the roots? That's a very painful experience. So he took his job and he went off to Pittsburgh and I had to sell the house and I had to sell the car and I had to sell the little truck and I had to arrange for the move and I had to transfer, you know how it goes, you know, nod your head if you know how that goes. You're stuck with everything, all the details. The move to Pittsburgh was not smooth. Let me just say that. I can explain it more if you want to know, but it was ugly. Um, but my focus was getting Dave and Jennifer settled. And everything I was feeling, all the anger, all the frustration, I just stuffed in my tummy. Every time I thought about moving, I ate something. Uh, have you ever done that? Mm -hmm. Nodding heads, yeah. Um, I ended up with a pre-ulcer condition, by the way, because I swallowed all of my feelings, all of them. <sighs> so anyway, I had done everything right. Um, I thought I had done everything right, but it didn't feel like it was going right. Um, I was really hurt and I was really angry. And eventually we found another church home. And I relaxed a bit because, as you know from my story, being at home in the church um, was a good feeling for me. 
So I began to sing in the choir and I chaperoned youth groups and the pastor asked me to lead an after school program for kiddos, um, which I just, I was in my element. I mean, that was the best of all worlds. Um, and one afternoon he stopped by and was listening in and he said, wow, you have a really neat gift for explaining scripture, interpreting scripture. I had a lamb chop sock puppet and I was telling the story of the lost sheep. I didn't think there was anything to that. Apparently it was profound. Uh, anyway, so I turned to him and I was in my snarky mood at the time. And I said, so what am I supposed to do with this freaking gift of telling stories from the Bible? He said, I don't know. Let's think about that. Well, his words jarred in me the truth that I was really unhappy with the way my life was working out. And I really wanted to break out of that negative mindset and kind of get on with things. And that's when I picked up a copy of a book called Something More by Catherine Marshall. Remember Catherine Marshall, who was the um, wife of Peter Marshall, the good pastor's wife? Well, she had also written a book called Christie. I don't know if any of you have read Christie. It's a story about Catherine Marshall's mother teaching school in um, an underprivileged area of Tennessee. And when I was teaching at my school in Kentucky, my mom had read that book and kept sending me resources and books because she knew that I was teaching uh, in such an underprivileged situation. So Catherine Marshall kind of follows me along here. But I got this book by Catherine Marshall and it talked about what can happen if you trust and obey what God is telling you. If you live in faith when you're discouraged, if you can experience God being faithful in challenging circumstances, and if you listen and learn from the Holy Spirit. So what was the Spirit nudging me to do? How do you say yes to something that is incredibly frightening? Well, it was clear to me, becoming clearer to me, that I didn't want to be a pastor's wife. Well, basically because Dave didn't want to be a pastor. But that wasn't what I wanted to be. I wanted to be the minister. I wanted to be a pastor. Now, Dave had married a school teacher who worked nine months out of the year and had the summers off. He married a woman who would have children and who would be a part of the community and would iron his shirts and pack his lunch and be the corporate wife who went to all of the parties. And if I chose to follow what my leading was, which was going into ministry, none of that would continue. Um, and as I would find out later, um, the road is not easy for women in ministry, or at least it wasn't back in the 80s. But I knew, I knew it felt so good and to think of being a minister. So one evening when he got home from work, I sat him down, I fixed him a little glass of bourbon, and I said, I figured out what I want to do. I want to be a minister. And then I waited. And within a minute, he looked up at me and he said, well, go ahead. That's what you've always wanted to do. Um, I was surprised. And neither of us knew what we had just committed to. But we were in it together. And he was clear that we were in it together and he would support whatever I was doing. So then I went to the pastor and I said, yeah, I'm thinking about a call to ministry. And he took me right to the Board of Bourdain Ministry in the church and got me connected in all the ways that would get me approved for the beginning of that process in the Methodist Church. And then I applied to Pittsburgh Seminary and um, was admitted there with credits from my early childhood education. So I only had to spend two years rather than three. Amazing, huh? It went from awful to amazing really quickly. So I was on track. I was in seminary. I had an assignment. 
Uh, my denomination was coming around me and telling me the things I need to do. And I could, I could picture it. I could actually picture me being a minister. Um, and then in my final semester of seminary, Dave's company transferred him to St. Louis. That was move number 14 or 15, I think. Um, so we began that process again, and um, it was it was awful. Uh, we had to find a seminary where I could finish up my courses if I didn't want to stay in Pittsburgh. Uh, we had to find an assignment for me because I had to do a practicum in ministry that semester. And if you know anything about Missouri Synod Lutherans, am I talking to any Lutherans in the crowd? Um, they don't accept women ministers, period. They won't let you into seminary if you're female, period, or at least they wouldn't back then. But I found a UCC seminary, and then I found an assignment, an appointment. Um, there was a pastor who had been chaplain at a home for abused and neglected children, and he had been dismissed on um, sexual charges. And so there was an opening. Ah, would you? Would I be willing to fill that? It was only part time, but would I be willing to follow up and do that? Well, when it, when I first started it, it was awful. It became amazing because have you ever tried to talk about the love of God to somebody whose father was abusive? You can't use God the Father and have it ring any familiar bells uh, in the lives of these kids. We had to search for another way they and I had to search to talk about God in words that would resonate with them. Uh, grandmother worked for them. God is grandmother because she was always rescuing uh, and caring for so many of these kids. The other one was Jesus as the big brother, because the big brother was also a safe person for a lot of these kiddos. At any rate, and the seminary, I went to a UCC seminary. It was good. I had some great professors. Um, eventually, it went full time, which was a blessing. But then, after two years, Dave's company closed the St. Louis office and let him go. So, I am in this underpaid but delightful position in Webster Groves, Missouri. It will not pay the mortgage. Um, he could not find work there. Um, I was lucky enough to find a position like I had through my connections with children's homes back in Pittsburgh. So I was assigned to a church part-time and a children's home part-time. Again, it looked good. We were back home. Jennifer was in a good school system anyway. Um, turned out that the pastor of that church um, had been there a long, long time, never had any difficulties in his ministry, couldn't understand anything about what I was going through. Dave was unemployed. Um, and where when I was at the children's home, they wanted me at church. And when I was at the church, they wanted me at the children's home. So it became a very conflicted kind of position. Um but we were home and Jen had good school and I had a few connections with my um, clergy friends from my previous years there. And eventually Dave found work again. Well, do you see a pattern developing here? Uh, going from awful to amazing and then back to awful. And I think that's true in some degree in everybody's life. It never stays amazing but it also never stays awful. If you can see what's going on and the things that are happening to you in the process. There are several more stories that I can relate to you, but there was always something more just waiting for the circumstances. And the big something more that I wanted to end with is when I was working for the Bishop's office, um, at one point, it became clear to me that the church was too small. My work in the church, I was a council director, which meant I did directed programming for hundreds of churches. 
um, and became a resource for them. But it wasn't enough. There was something else that was supposed to be happening, and I didn't know what it was. Also, the bishops change, and when the bishops change, the staff changes. It's like uh, when any in any organization, when the leadership changes, everything is up for grabs. And I needed to move, and I thought, what can I do? What can I do? Well, I thought, start my own consulting business. That's easy enough to do. And I called my friend who had started her own consulting business, and I said, Lisa, tell me how to do this. And she said, don't do that. Come work for me. Well, but she was in manufacturing consulting. I didn't know anything about machines or business. And my vocabulary was all churchy stuff. She said, don't worry, you can learn all this stuff. Come on. So I went to work for Chesapeake Consulting. We moved to Annapolis, Maryland. Glorious 10 years of traveling, of meeting people. It was awful at first because nobody cared that I had a degree in theology. Nobody cared that um, I wore robes and stoles and stuff because I didn't wear it around them. Um, I was just totally free of all of the trappings um, of religion. I was just me, being there, being me. And, and that was enough. So that was a big transition. And I did that. I worked at the FAA. Um, I worked at a retread tire company. I helped make ballet tutus. I mean, it was just glorious. It's amazing. And then I retired and moved to West Virginia, where I am now. So I figured out that resilience is directly related to your faith. Does that make sense? That there has to be, they have to be together. Your ability to bounce back, your ability to, uh, my ability to see the possibilities of a situation is, is dependent on my faith. My faith that says God makes life beautiful, amazing, awful, ordinary, but beautiful. And it's meant to be that way. One little story um, about karma. I, I asked at one point to be appointed to an inner city church that had a heart for mission. Well, the only one that was coming up that time was a poor inner city church struggling to stay alive, uh, financially strapped. Nobody wanted to go there. So they sent me. Uh, um, the day after I got my announcement of the appointment, that congregation received a grant of $500,000 from a local member who saw the future of community ministry in that area. And guess what? Every man in the conference wanted that, not one of that church. They all said, well, Penny, you don't know that much about handling money. No way I was giving up that. We had a glorious ministry in that place, um, having fun figuring out what to do with all that money. Um, but, you know, karma, that's what I call it. Anyway, lots of more stories to tell you, but that's, that's the general overview of being able to see something more in your life than what it is right now and not ever being settled, not ever being... Um, trapped, not ever being limited. And that limited view I had of being a minister's wife back when I was eight or nine years old expanded so much because I kept getting these nudges. And I took the risk at that one point and I said, Dave, I got to do this. And I prayed, I prayed, God, don't take me away from my husband and my kid. And I still have my husband. My kid is fine. My grandkids are fine. It all worked out. It wasn't easy. Sometimes it was awful. But man, amazing. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you so much, Penny. Um, 
what I'm doing right now is I'm just trying to jot down some of the questions that we talked about uh, for people in the chat box. And the first question I put up was, think of a time when you were asked to take a risk, big or small, what feelings did you have? Um, I'm going to put down the next three questions as you go into groups. So <clears throat> if you all know how to check your chat box, that'll help you if you need to get back on track on what we're talking about. But the other um, part that Penny suggested was, what self-talk did you experience? How did you deal with the circumstances that made you angry, frustrated, frightened? When did you face a bleak future? And yet, as you lived into it, you found something more. What has happened when you have invited the Holy Spirit to guide your life? Who would like to talk about what happened in your discussion? Oh, so, um, so can you hear me, Terry? Yes, I can. So I tried to send you a message, but I saw the 55 oh. seconds. Um, Michelle was in mid-speak. <laughs> oh, and Michelle, please finish. Well, the one the one thing I was saying at the end was the statement that um, uh, that Penny made was that I wrote down that just really um, resonated with me was um, the ability to bounce back based on your faith. Um, and that no matter what life hands you or what you're going through, that in itself is a hundred percent true statement. You can bounce back no matter what you're going through, but it is based upon your relationship with the Lord and your faith and where you where where you're at because it 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 can be a it can be a challenge no matter what is handed to you. But um, so that was I was that's what I was sharing as we were being moved back into the big group. <laughs> and I and let me jump in, Tony. Um, didn't get to say anything. So I do want to, if she has something that she wants to offer. Is that okay, Terry? Well, I'm saying it. Tony. <laughs> okay, so real quickly, that was, you know, the, that faith got you through. And that is really true. Um, in my case, a lot of times, all you have is faith. If you lose your job and, you know, you're the only person <laughs> that is the uh, breadwinner and you really... I took that time, I had lost a job to get closer to the Lord, you know, to try to, you know, deepen my faith. And I just really find that He goes before you. I mean, He's already worked out all things in your life before you get there. And it's awful, but you know that He has an, I think now in, in the time of my life, I know that He has answers for whatever is going on in your life and He's already working it out. It might not. You might not see it and you might not see it for a while, mm -hmm. but you always have that faith Great. there working it out for you. Um, I did. I do have something more from Catherine Marshall and I'm going to look it up. And so I can read it again. It's been a long time. And um, my son just lost his job and I really want that faith. You know, that was, you know, you have to have faith to get through, you know, what you're going through when you lose a job. But that's all I'm. Mm -hmm. That's all I need to say, I guess, for today. <laughs> well, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure that, and there may have been people from other groups. That seemed like a really short, um, short and short and sweet breakout. Anyway, I just wanted <laughs> to make sure that um, at least the two people and Penny was in my group, so you know, we. we I'm not going to defer to you right right now, Penny, but I wanted to make sure that Tony and Michelle. Um, and I think Eleanor had shared, but anyway, back we'll back to you, um, Terry. Thank you. Well, any so any other groups? What did you did you talk? What did you t say about resilience? Was that a conversation? Um, would somebody from a, my, the group that I was in like to share what we talked about? Yeah. 
No, nobody from our group <laughs> wants to talk about well, I, I can say this. This is a no judgment zone. Joyce is talking, but she needs to unmute. unmute. Yes. You're still muted, Joyce. <laughs> Look at the little microphone at the bottom, maybe. Yeah, on the left-hand side. And just click on that red slash. I will say that for a while, um, Michelle was having some problems in our group with her. It didn't show she was muted, but she huh. we couldn't hear her. Yeah, I'm sorry, she's muted. Yeah. Um, Denise, Denise, would you like to make a couple of comments about what we talked about? Oh, wait a minute. I uh, got it. I just found she, it. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't get to speak during our breakout, but I did capture some comments that I'll uh, uh, um, share. And um, so um, some of the some of the responses were, were um, that um, we do self-talk and that humor is a good resource for relieving stress. And that came from Denise. Um, uh, Winona talked about how sometimes we nurture fear and um so and i think that's true sometimes you know we get we find ourselves in a situation that's really uncomfortable and or and hard and we think the worst and 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 then that that's when we need to remember that as Tony was saying earlier, that you know, God, our he he has a plan for our lives. He has the answers, and we just need to remember that faith is what we need to stand on. And faith is the opposite of fear. I remind myself of that all the time. Peggy one talked of the about gratitude being one of her ways of dealing with um, difficulty, and maybe Winona once. Maybe she has something she wants to say more about the nurturing fear. I don't know, but I just wanted to give everyone else a chance to talk if they would like to. I I can be winded, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, good well, morning. I was on mute and didn't know it, so. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I I did I did say something about we nurture fear, like in our society, and I wouldn't want to leave. I wouldn't want to leave without explaining what I meant by that because it sounds it sounds dark or negative and I prefer, you know, breath of fresh air, right? It's like, I would like to think of something hopeful and, and meaningful. And, and so when I said nurture fear, I think when we get scared, when things don't go the way we want them to go and we get scared, uh, you know, sometimes we don't know how to open the door of our own faith. We don't know how to do that. And so we hold on to our fear. And so when I said we nurture our fear, I didn't mean that we do that individually. I think our society nurtures fear. It shows us things to be afraid of and then says, this is socially acceptable. And I disagree with that. You know, I, I don't, I think we should be nurturing each other and choosing joy and, and being brave when we're afraid. I, I think that's what we're supposed to be doing. And it's not always a comfortable uh, space to say that in, but I feel very comfortable right here. <laughs> so I think sometimes we nurture fear, but I think we have just as much of an ability to nurture our faith if we know it. And the way to know it is to like accept that we do and go from there. So I, I try to bring it. I, you know, I don't do it every day, but I try to bring it. One of the most frequent scripture passages is be not afraid. Mm -hmm. Or as my choir right. director said, be not as scared. And I, I agree, Winona. It's so tempting to just back away and say, nah, it's too risky. I can't do that. I, I can't see the way forward to do it. Therefore, I will just stay here and be afraid. And at some point, 
we have to open ourselves to let something or someone nudge us forward, confirm the positive of what will happen with that decision and take the step, the step in faith that we all talk about kind of glibly. But man, you're stepping off a cliff where you can't see the bottom of the cavern mm -hmm. and you're just going to free float for a while. Um, that can be fearful, but it can also be fun. Mm -hmm. um, those are we have a choice. I think Winona keeps saying that we have we can choose not to be afraid. Mm -hmm. it's hard. I, was just, I was just reading in Acts yesterday where uh, they got first they were beaten. Paul and Silas, I think, was and then they went into jail. So they're beaten to hell, and then they're you know in jail, and then they're singing how happy they are. <laughs> I was like, that's what I need to remember rather than yelling at God, which is what I tend to do because life doesn't go my way. Um, you know, just remember to sing songs of praise and see what happens. So even in the Psalms, David was, he poured his heart out to God. He told him what, you know, what he thought, didn't think was right. And he, you know, we just can go with the Psalms and, and know that we can be honest with God. I think that's what you were being honest with God, you know, why? Um, yeah. I had a, I had a nun years ago that did a workshop on writing Psalms and everybody wrote how furious they were. And then you have to end it with, nevertheless, your name is great. And you're <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Did, it, did everyone see my comment? I put in the chat, I didn't give Eleanor a chance to say it, but what Eleanor brought out in our group about um, sometimes she's been angry with God mm -hmm. and that she, she, she expressed her anger to God. If, am I, am I correct? I am I paraphrasing that correctly? Yeah. I yell at God. <laughs> yell at, yeah. So, you know, but he can handle it. He's got big wings. I have a friend that, um, was dying of cancer and she was talking about how angry her children were. And they're like, I hate God and he's not right. And got it done. She goes, he can handle it. Go ahead and yell. Mm -hmm. Let mm -hmm. it out. Tell him what you think. And they were like, you're not going to talk me out of this? She said, no. This is mm -hmm. conversing with your faith and with your God. And she, he can handle it. Mm -hmm. And so some days I go, I don't get it, girl, but um, okay. Mm -hmm. You're out there. I assume you're watching over me. As our Pats and my youngest sister said, I had to make God a woman because I'm afraid of authority. And I've had a lot of very authoritative men in my life. She said, so my God has become my girlfriend and my mm -hmm. grandmother. Mm -hmm. And that, that little shift meant a lot to me. I was like, you know, I am more comfortable talking to a woman. Um, especially about what my innermost things, things I wouldn't even probably discuss with my husband, it's just a, that conversation that goes on in your head. So, and like Penny said, you know, things that don't trigger other thoughts and keep you from your conversation. Right. I think that's where the Holy, uh, the God in three persons mm -hmm. comes in because God, the father, God, the son and God, the Holy spirit, Holy spirit is like the mother figure. So, the female, you know, the, that kind of spirit thing. So you really just speak it to the Holy Spirit, which is God, right. the Father, and the Son all put together and, you know, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> that reminds yeah, God me does not need pronouns. Yeah. God, God does not need pronouns. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we live in a world that for mm -hmm. a lot of years is based in patriarchy. And so the norm was male and, you yeah. know, well, you know, Winona's mother, Edie, bless her soul, had a saying, and I just recently started kind of really getting it. Edie said, and Winona, you may have heard her say this sometime. Edie said, I'm getting this, my low whatever, anyway, that the Bible is not about God's dealing with the Jews. The Bible is about the Jews dealing with God. And most of the people who had the pen were male. So the you know the the writings are going to be patriarchal because of the people who were writing it. 
Um, so um, so I, I often think about that. Yeah, it's, it's just about who who was writing the story? Who was putting it, who, who was um, doing the oral story, Kelly? And who was documenting what was going on? And the people who didn't have a voice were that's they weren't the ones who were telling the story. Yeah. Thank um, you, Natalie. Um, thank you, thank, thank you, Natalie. You. And, and Marlene, I think if you would share what you said about resilience. Oh, uh, in in our group, we we had some powerful examples of the awful moments in life and how resilience gets us through it. But we also came to a consensus thinking this through that. A, it is helpful to have models of resiliency that you already look up to as a child and mm -hmm. see how, for instance, parents deal with very difficult situations, because that also helps you have confidence that you can see through the awfulness of situations. Mm -hmm. And the second most powerful uh, consensus was that resiliency is also built within community. So when you have, a, for instance, a cancer diagnosis that is overwhelming and uh, to know that you have a partner who, who listens and is acknowledging that as well as a community, family, friends, your church community can make all the difference in the world as to how we really uh, use our resiliency in a way within the context of our faith also to have hope in a very authentic manner. Thank you, Marlene. And on that note, I want to say that Marlene is going to be our guest next month. So I hope all of you will come and join us in March to, um, I think Marlene and I met through uh, Bishop Porter and our study groups during COVID. And someday I'm going to meet you face to face. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone for coming. And Natalie, I'm going to ask you to give our closing prayer and then I'm going to ask the team and Penny and Marlene, if you'd like to join us um, for a little overview yeah. at the end here. Yes. Okay. Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So, you know, I've been thinking about this all along that so I don't have any, have anything pre pre prepared. Um, so, yeah. So this is, you know, I'm a, I'm a Baptist. So, you know, we shoot from the, <laughs> I got the prayer book in my hand, but um, let us pray. Dear, dear God, Mother God, how amazing this has been to have Penny come and share with us and for all of us to share with each other our awful experiences, our amazing experiences, and basically how we got over and how we continue to get over. We give you thanks and praise for this gathering because no, without you, we know that where we are, you are there in our midst. And we, we give you glory and thanks and praise. Now we go out to do the job you have given us to, done, to do. Amen. 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 Terry, you. did you want to show my books? Yeah, Amen. would you hold them up? I put them in the um, chat, but would you hold them up so you can... Penny is quite the prolific author. Again, this is something more. I retired. I thought, what am I going to do? And the Women's Bible Study Group said, why don't you write a book about whatever. This is called Christina's Gift. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. it. It's based on my ministry in Pittsburgh. So some of the things I talked about are in there. Um, but it's parallel a little bit to the Gospel of John. So it, it makes a good uh, study story. Um, so Christina's an, a woman minister in Pittsburgh. And if you know Pittsburgh, it's kind of fun to read. This is Laura's quest. Laura is Christina's daughter, and she goes back to South Jersey to discover her roots and her family. So it kind of follows on this, but they don't have to read them in that order. And then the this one came out just before I had my knee surgery. So we haven't done any promotion of it yet. It's called Sarah's Spring. Sarah is Christina's grandmother. So this is set back in the 1800s, and she um, has to make her way in the world and uh, find she finds her way back to New Jersey to the farm. So those are the three books. You can get them on Amazon or any other booksellers online. Um, they're fun reads. They're not hard. Um, and I'd love your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. 
and I've enjoyed all three. <laughs> Peace. Thank you, Safe everyone. Safe week. See you in March. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Terry, I'm giving you a big hug. <laughs> Yay. Oh, this is always so heart filling. Just well, can I get on your list of people to come? Oh yes. Am I allowed? Yes. I think, it would, I, think I, I think I would enjoy this a lot. Okay. Well, I I, I hope I have you in our group email, but I will go back and verify so that okay. you'll get your notifications in the link. Perfect. And if you feel called to invite others, please do. We've had people from Australia. We've had people from Minnesota. We've had people from California. It's amazing how the word gets out. Didn't mm -hmm. we have somebody present from Canada? Oh, yeah. Oh, when we were talking about joy in life, um, Kathy Nesbitt is our, was a speaker that we had last April, um, and she has a thing called Laughter Yoga, yoga. and she does Kathy's Chuckle Club, yeah. and I join that every Tuesday at 9.30, and you can't play and dance and laugh for a half hour and not have it carry through the day, and mm -hmm. that's, um, and so this morning as the guys were headed out, and you know, that typical Get them in the car, get them dressed, get them, you know. I said, try to laugh sometime today. And Tom's response was, we will. So yeah. I hope they did. Sure. What does that say? Laugh more. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so um, that's what I got from another one of our wonderful speakers. Yeah, we found her. We found her um, at the International Joy Summit. Wow. <laughs> and I, I was I just went through the uh, you could see who had registered for the summit. It was an international summit. And I just went through it and picked some people that looked very interesting and contacted them. And she said she would be happy to join us. So that's how we found her. Yeah. Well, very resourceful. So, so Marlene. Yeah. I hope you're going to be comfortable with us next month. I think you will be. I think you know the routine. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to you sharing your thoughts. Penny, I really appreciate what you did today. And if you have suggestions on how to continue to grow this ministry, we're always open to suggestions. Yeah. And Marlene has been with us several times. Um, oh, yeah. For, so she kind of has an idea of like, you know, how she has some idea of what we've been doing here. Um, it's, it's, it's not novel. So um, I think that, you know, whatever you say is going to be just the way it's supposed to be. So I'm, I'm enthusiastic and looking forward to that and, and very grateful for Penny to have shared her hope and strength. So I wanted to have some clarification, Manona, because you said that you were going to, uh, through an e-newsletter or something like that, a wider public is is that still the case or yeah I haven't I actually haven't talked to Terry about that yet ah, ah, ah. since I talked to you but the di the diocese said that we could put we could advertise breath of I don't like to use the word advertise but promote um, I had had some communication where the di di diocese of Virginia was going to allow us to put information regarding breath of fresh air on their website, and we were hoping that we could use the information that we have been sending in an email to the audience that we could put that information on the website. That's what we were talking about. Right. Am so I answering now, your question? So now we'll be on their calendar. So if you go to the Diocese of Virginia and look at their calendar, they will have you listed for um, March. Right. Oh, I see. And um, I don't know how we're going to expand that, but... I feel like I got it in the door, so now we'll be able to add more to it. It might bring a larger audience to our, um, you know, it might bring more people to participate, which would be great. You know, right. I mean, the one nice thing about Zoom is there's room for whoever wants to come. We don't have to look for another chair or, you know, find one in the <laughs> closet or, you know, 
remind them where the bathrooms are, you know. <laughs> but it a, may be more challenging for you, Terry, than to go into small group discussions, depending on how large the group yeah, is. Yeah, right? <laughs> it we, could be. We but, may um, need to revisit how we possibly do that then. Yeah, because 15 or 20 is a very difference if, you know, if you right. uh, double that. Yes. Possibly. Yeah. Well, we've been very fortunate, very fortunate so far. I'm and just amazed that we've done this for four years. So we've had probably over whatever four times eight is um, sessions. Mm. And um, everyone has had a little pearl that people could refer back to. And mm -hmm. I, when and I taught, David Evans. Yeah. And thank you to David Evans, who puts it all together and then puts it out there. And it usually happens within a week after we get together. And when I taught school, one of the little things I did is I always tried to have a birthday card for a kid on their birthday. And one year, this boy that was kind of a hard child to work with came up to me after school and was just sobbing. And I said, what, what's going on? And he goes, this is the first birthday card I've ever gotten. Oh, wow. And so you never know what that one little thing's going to do. That's right. And that's the way I feel about Breath of Fresh Air. You never know. Uh, who it's going to speak to and what it's going to do. And knowing you, Terry, that I I can't imagine that you, how long it took you to pull yourself together. <laughs> because I'm such a crybaby. <laughs> no, no, I'm so grateful for you. Terry, I, I, I'm going to have to leave. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, I'll talk to you more. Um, thank you again, Penny, for coming um, and welcome. sharing. I really, really appreciate it. I, you know, I, I think I'm long-winded, so I try not to be when we do this. I don't want to you know, give room to the other people to um, to share. And and okay. um, Marlene, I'm really looking forward to um, next month. And thank you so much, Natalie and Terry. Thank you. Uh, thank I you, really Anuna. do have to go, but um, okay. Terry, I'll be talking to you soon. All right. Okay. All of you have a great week. All right. Yes. Thank you. Keep the faith. Terry, oh, can you stay on like one more minute? Okay. 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 See you. Take care, Marlene. Bye. Take care, Penny. Bye-bye.